I created a giant bracket to a parenthesis in which all the action would happen. Yeah. You begin with his father beating him to the ground and saying, so now get up. And then you end with the question. He's on the ground, he's bleeding, he's dying, he experiences his dying. And then what? And that's the question, but there is a light. So uh, maybe he will, uh, the dead will rise. Uh, this is not the end. And so what I wanted to do was not to leave the reader hopeless. It was important to me that his own religious faith should find an echo in the book so that to him there is an afterlife. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure myself in general, but for him there is. You know, the end is tragic, but it's not hopeless. No, it isn't. There's a big difference between the first scene and the last scene because in the first scene you need all these details outside of him. But yes. in the last scene, you're inside of him. I think to a degree in both scenes, because in the last scene, as he's dying, he's seeing the red, the fluid red, which is his own blood. But as he thinks of it, it is the robe of his great mentor, Cardinal Wolsey. So he thinks all I have to do is follow that scarlet and that takes him into his death. And he feels a movement beneath him which he equates to the River Thames, but it's also the River Styx carrying him over. So there is um, a direct sensory description of what he's experiencing second by second that is an echo of the, the beginning of the book. I knew that Henry chose an inexperienced uh, henchman to do it and um, it could have been so much worse but it was on a religious level almost that you described what happened and I was very glad that you did. I think the legend of the inexperienced headsman, it is just that, it is a legend. Um, it is possible, but I don't think Henry um, was interested in Cromwell's death to that degree. If he had wished to cause him pain, he could have decreed a far more dreadful death for him. and. It's always a question with legend. Um, how much do you admit that tradition into the fiction? So I have thought about this a lot and I thought Cromwell's own estimate of the headsman is that he's young, he's nervous, and he could probably do with more practice. But I'm not saying it, it's a deliberate, malicious choice. But I am going this far with the legend that his death is not instant. So he has time to know that he's dying. And in those few seconds, or a minute or two at most, his mind takes him right back to his early life. So as he feels cold in himself, um, his mind goes back to a day long ago when he walked in the snow and the young monk he was with fell into the snow. This is a real incident detailed in a letter. And so he is in a sense ranging over his whole life as he tries to make sense of what his body is experiencing. But yes, it is. It must be a death informed by his religious faith. Mm -hmm.
what what is history is is history what happened or what we tell that happened well i i have said in my vith lectures a couple of years ago with it it's it, it it's almost what's what's left in a net or sieve when everything else was drained through and i think that there's a, a fertile contradiction here a creative contradiction because someone like me spends a lot of time trying to cut away legend and pare an account down to the verifiable facts that are well witnessed by witnesses who are unbiased as far as they can be so you do all that and you look at facts and figures but then on the other hand you are dealing with a corpus of myth and it's your job to mediate between the two and to consider why there might be a tradition about um a, a certain facet of your subject's life i thought i was very interested that uh, you find thomas cromwell as a young man he traveled in italy but the early novelist matteo bandello whose books gave shakespeare a lot of his subjects he also wrote about thomas cromwell mm. and it is bandello who has him as a sort of young englishman abroad a um trickster figure mm. so he is straight from the corpus of myth which we all recognize the universal figure of the young man who um he doesn't have money he doesn't have a great family he doesn't have even good looks but he's smart and he's smarter than everyone else around him and this is how cromwell appears in bandello's little stories and so i thought you know i have to take account of this too that figure of cromwell must appear not on my page but he must he must be in the background somewhere the, there are the historical facts yes but there's also the novelist yeah who gives her own pace and her own arc to the story and it's your freedom to choose to use certain uh, facts and others not was there a conflict for you uh, were there scenes that you had to omit in order to make the story better I think it's just the same for a narrative historian you have to select in order to structure your narrative otherwise your reader will be overwhelmed by detail and not know what was important and what wasn't important i guess a novelist selects on a slightly different basis because a novelist is very obviously and deliberately looking for the dramatic turning points and in each scene you write you're looking for the turning points within it and i try to avoid too much and then and then and then i i try to work in sharply defined scenes so the narrative isn't quite stitched together in the way a historian would do it I'm not conscious of having to omit material but there is one big constraint for me which is that the narrative can only be where Cromwell is mm -hmm. uh everything is seen really from his point of view so there is in the middle of the book 
a very important episode where there is a revolt in the North Country. Now Cromwell stays in the South with the King. So I can't take my narrative to the North. So I can't be where things are happening. And that was difficult, of course, because you are aware that the dramatic events are all occurring off the page. So my answer to that was, I think about what it is like to wait for news, mm -hmm. knowing that by the time you get the news, it is out of date, even if it was accurate in the first place, which it probably wasn't. And uh, quite a few years ago, we had um, uh, a foreign secretary here, um, Douglas Hurd. I heard him give a talk one day and he said, um, what I learned about the news from abroad is that the first version is always wrong. Now, of course, we're going back to the days when uh, news was so easy to transmit. We're going back before those days. And I thought, you know, that's really interesting. So I, I said that almost word for word in the book yeah. uh, because I picture them trying to run this campaign from the south of England when a message is going to take five days to arrive. And where is it going to arrive? The action will have moved on. And it's a history, therefore, of confusion and delay and tension. So I needed to use those scenes to, to ratchet up the tension when apparently nothing is happening. You know, it's like my favourite game, cricket, when people think nothing is happening everything is happening. <laughs> so this was, um, this was a sort of technical challenge mm -hmm. embedded in the book. But I think I got, I, I, I hope I got away with that, okay? Because I think by this stage, the reader is interested in Cromwell and Henry and their reactions more than the action itself. Just pops in my head now. Was Thomas Cromwell your first reader in your head? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I, I probably think of a very good answer to that once you've gone. Um, now, my first reader is Ben Miles, the actor who played Cromwell on stage. Uh, and he has often been quite literally the first reader because he's been, you know, he's seen the manuscript in bits and at all sorts of stages. And uh, I would sometimes, you know, I, I would stop and think, can I see this through his eyes? Can I hear it in his voice? In a way, it's Cromwell. So it is Cromwell's deputy, as it were. Yes, yes, you're quite right. Now, also, I would hear Henry. Now, I've got two Henrys. The stage Henry, the TV Henry. And I would move between them when I was creating Henry. Uh, often the voice of one and the face of the other. This didn't happen in the first two books, so there's a, uh, a different kind of... Yeah, yeah, that's quite true. Um, I d don't know who I would describe the, as the first reader there, except that, as one must, I get out of the position of writer and into the position of reader. And I think with historical fiction, you have to be quite ad adept and adroit, nimble at moving between those two positions. You know, you write something, you turn around and you're the reader of it because you need always to be running an information check, um, putting yourself in the position of the reader who doesn't know what you know. So 
it comes a second nature to be your own mm -hmm. reader, I think, at every stage. And then you're quite right. Something very momentous happened between the, f the first two books and the third book, which was a translation into other media. Yeah. And, of course, that is like a haunting. Mm. You have a haunted text then because you know that... Um, or you might say it's like an echo chamber because you know that what you've written will go into other forms. You know, yeah. I've known all along that there will be another TV series and that hopefully there will be another play. So... Now, I've often thought, how can she free herself from that very powerful imagery of that of that TV series. But you, you did an interview about that and you said, well, I know more than they do. Yes, that that's right. And of course, there was more in the script and more in the edit than actually appeared on the screen. And the screenwriter, Peter Strawn, I found worked in a way that was strikingly sympathetic to the text yep. because I found that when it came to my reading of the first draft he had an uncanny ability as it were to take the image out of my head and to know which ones were really potent for me. Mm. Now not all of those made their way into the final version but it was important that they were there at some stage. They hit the page. Um, there was there was the picture of Cromwell standing by the Thames looking at the stranded whale, um, which it, 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 you know that that was important for me, though in the book he's not described as going there, but the whale, it's in his mind, you know, they come to him and they say a whale's beached in the Thames and he, he says, have I to do something about it? He doesn't really know why they're telling him. And they, <laughs> the screenwriter had him actually going down and staring at the corpse, you know. Um, an image of all the work that's that's coming down the road to him, um, the great insoluble problems. Um, it didn't get to the screen, and you know, similarly, when the king loses his hat when he's out hunting, and um, by night it's we imagine it in a tree roosting like a bird, you know. In a way, when I put these there, I think TV will go for that, you know. Yeah. Or I write a certain line and I think that's one for the play, yeah, yeah, straight yeah. in. Um, so, yes, you, you are conscious of all these other forms, but I think that's given the third book a certain bounce. Um, I don't think it's lost anything. I don't think it's confused the issue for me. I think it's enriched the text. When you started, you said Thomas Cromwell interested me because he came from the forge to the court. You wondered, was it the man? Was it the circumstance? Was it the time? What was it? Now you've finished the third book. Do you have an answer? I think what interests me is the man in his time. Uh, just as when I wrote my French Revolution book, my question was always, why him? What's special about this man or that man or that woman? And why was it them? Could it have been someone else? Um, are they blindfold actors? Or 
you know, to what extent is fate working through a certain individual? Are certain individuals more capable of bearing a destiny than others? You see, I'm interested in this from every perspective, from the way the ancient Greeks would have perceived it to the way a Marxist would mm -hmm. perceive it. Um, if I were able to make my mind up on that question about the individual and the forces that shape him and the forces he acts on, I wouldn't have anything more to say, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's the problem that you worry your way out all your life, knowing there are many aspects to it you can reflect on, but there's no final answer. It, it struck me that he needed the cardinal, but the king also needed the cardinal, and the cardinal is always there the, yes. t up till the end, that yes. Henry says he never forgave me Wolsey. Yes. So and that behind this man is the cardinal, uh, yes. even for doing the dirty work. Yes, the cardinal's always there, and I thought, well, that's just a bit of a religious. Although it's it's not God Himself, God is everywhere present. There was a surprise to me in the book about Wolsey because when I began, I had thought Wolsey's ghost is going to be around and about this book almost not in every scene but it's going to be a constant a constant reference point for Cromwell what would the cardinal do and then the cardinal pops up with the answer um, but actually it wasn't like that because mm. there's a point in the book where Cromwell goes to see Wolsey's daughter Dorothea in her convent and it goes very badly because he doesn't realise when he walks in to see her that Dorothea believes he betrayed her father. So he cannot shake her conviction about this. And when he walks out of her presence, it's the only time in the three books that we see him completely at a loss. We've seen him um, in great grief and sorrow, uh, but we haven't seen him losing his grip of a situation. And when he comes out of that room, he does lose his grip on the situation. And then what was a surprise to me is that the Cardinal goes and he doesn't come back till the very end of the book. And that great absence, it is like someone losing their faith mm -hmm. um, because the warmth has gone out of his life. It's as if grace has been withdrawn and um, the, it, it, it's almost as if one uh, say one were in the religious life and you know you've lost your vocation. So it's a harsh world for him without his way of talking to the cardinal. He can ask the cardinal questions, but the cardinal doesn't talk back. But then at the very end, he is there. And now I'm already confusing, you see, what I've done in the book and what I'm going to do in the play. <laughs> Because, again, when I first imagined a play, I imagined the Cardinal as almost um, a one-man chorus who would be talking us through the action. Now, I can't use him in that way because for, uh, uh, for, for, for certain um, parts of the narrative, he is just absent. So... I almost didn't mean to do that. I shocked myself. It struck me just now that the narrative got the better of you. Yes. It, and now you put it this way, I think in this vacuum 
of having a father figure mm -hmm. that is uh, caring. Yes. He longs for Henry to give him titles and yes. uh, for his protection. He's a bit lost. He's building a fortress around himself uh, as far as he can. He doesn't have the claim to a great family name like almost all of Henry's other advisors. And he doesn't have the protection of being a churchman. So he doesn't gain status through the church as Cardinal Wolsey did. So his method is to take on more and more work and amass more titles, more offices. I think he was a man who was much more interested in power than the names we give power. Um, I think it was, it, it was very necessary for him to become Lord Cromwell, to give him the necessary status to operate. But he doesn't seem to have been worried about the fact that he didn't have the, a wonderful ancestry mm -hmm. because people offered to make up some ancestors for him and he wouldn't have it. No, he's always downplaying it, isn't he? Yes, so uh, he, he obviously, in a very modern way, regarded himself as good enough. If he was good enough for the king, he was good enough for anybody. But yet he has to buttress his status. Um, not least so that he can deal with foreign powers so that they know he is a man of importance and not just someone who's here today and gone tomorrow. But in the end, his lack of a family network is it's something that in the England of that time, you could not get away from that, I think. he tear down families as well, uh, uh, and also uh, great families. Exactly. He says that he doesn't regard their ancient bloodline. Dame is no more than the blood of a dog. Mm. And he has that outsider's ability to operate like a wrecking ball. And yet such outbursts of feeling are comparatively rare with him. Mostly, as um, I, I say, he's the soul of courtesy and he works within the rules. But everybody knows he has the capacity to break them. But even though he's doing all these He's wrecking reputations and being um, an instrument of, of revenge in the hands of the king. The sympathy for him never leaves you. It's there from the first pages of the book and it it's continues till the end. And is this because you feel a little sympathy for him as well even? Or is it because you're in his head, you're in his delusion? That's a really good question. Um, I think I can say in a fairly straightforward way, I admire him. I uh, admired him from the early days of the research. I didn't necessarily go into it feeling that when I began. I just thought he's really interesting. He's bad, but he's interesting. And then I went through a phase of thinking, actually, I, I understand everything he did and why he did it. And he's certainly no more ruthless than the king's other advisors. And in this instance and in that instance, he acts as a moderating influence. He's patient. He negotiates. And then I began to panic a bit and I thought, what if he's not bad enough, <laughs> you see? Um, and then I, I took a step back. I, I got, I suppose, more firmly inside himself and inside his career. And I thought, what's this man hiding? 
Mm-hmm. What's happened to him in the past? What was his early life? What has he done to survive it? And what does it take to be so single-minded? And to have the nerve, the strength of mind to confront someone like Henry every day. And every day to maintain faith in yourself. That seems to me the miraculous thing. He never loses that self-confidence. He's full of bounce. He's really resilient. So then I wasn't really thinking, is he good, is he bad? That This became not relevant. It was only a question of, if you were him, what would you do to survive and thrive? And I would say from that point of view, I don't feel alienated from anything he he did. The problem is, and it's very much a problem for a modern reader, we know he assented to torture, as did every other minister of Henry's. Um, Torture in England was, it was not frequent. It was not part of the judicial apparatus as in some countries, Uh, but it did happen. We know it happened. And we know that on occasion he recommended it should be done. It's very difficult for a modern reader to get their head around that. And you, know, however, that you were describing a world where sooner or later almost everybody suffers atrocious pain. Mm. I'm not saying that that is any kind of excuse, but you do realise you are living... um, You're not living under modern conditions. The world is a merciless world. It is a harsh one. As I say, this this is no kind of excuse, but it may point the way to understanding. You're living with a completely different set of expectations. And um, after all, it's, um, it, it's... No, I, I'm not sure I can say any more about that meaningfully. I, I think I found it probably the hardest thing to live with but what I do think I think I have represented accurately he will bribe you he will sweet talk you he will trick you before he will hurt you because that's a smoother and better way in that it gets you a better result. So he is entirely pragmatic. He's a man who, in my construction of him, can regard everything, including human flesh, with the very practical eye of a butcher. But I bear in mind that trickster, you see, Mm -hmm. that you find in those early novellas and that has been part of my my way of constructing him. When he witnesses heretics being burned, yeah. he's always very moved and uh, he doesn't like it at all. And that creates sympathy again. Well, he is not devoted to increasing the amount of pain in the world. And... The death toll in Henry's reign uh, would have been a good deal higher if Cromwell had not exercised a restraining hand. And for instance, the aristocrats who one sees being executed towards the end of 1538, early 1539, Under most regimes, those people would all have gone five years earlier, Mm -hmm. Um, but they wasted all their chances. But I think 
back in 1534, 35, there would have been an absolute bloodbath if Cromwell had not been on the scene, if some other minister, let us say the Duke of Norfolk, uh, had been closest to Henry. You portray him as a man who tries always to avoid pain, and I always make uh, a connection with the pain he suffered from his father, the fire in the forge. He knows how hot fire is. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, he, he, um, he, he's passed through suffering himself, uh, and what in in and this is fiction um it, it has made a deep impression on him is seeing the burning of an old woman um she is of course a real person but the fact that he saw it is my fiction um he carries this with him all his whole life so he's not someone who shuts off his imagination but what he is he's an optimist and it seems to me that this is why he wasn't simply giving his opponents a long rope. Mm -hmm. He actually really thought that people could be talked back, won back into loyalty and conformity mm -hmm. with the King's line. Lady Lyle is a case in point. Um, she was the wife of the man who was in charge of Calais, Lord Lyle, the king's cousin. And on a Lyle, there is no doubt about it, was a completely unrepentant papist. And in her very powerful capacity as the governor's wife, um, was doing her best to stop the progress of the Reformation in Calais. And he's insanely optimistic about honour. Yeah. There is a letter, oh, I don't quote it in the book, but he says, you know, we will win her a little and a little. And you think, oh, Cromwell, you, you know, you are not going to convert this woman. But he seems to have that disposition to human nature that they will see sense or they will see their best interest perhaps that's what it is mm -hmm. you know he himself is so good at self-preservation and he's had to think so much about self-preservation so he assumes that other people will use their wit mm -hmm. um and if necessary, I suppose, compromise their principles if it comes to staying alive. And of course, he has to get over his amazement about this because so many people either blunder into Henry's bad graces, into arrest and death, or like Thomas More, they say, well, here's my frontier and I won't cross it even to save my life. You don't only write in present tense, you speak about him in present tense. Yes. Yeah. yes. Is it, was, it, was it hard to let him go? You see, he didn't, and that's why I'm speaking in present tense, because there are the other versions to be worked for. Okay. And, of course, when you actually finish a book, or well, when do you finish it? Mm -hmm. No, at the moment I'm reading proofs, so um, I still have the chance. Now I, I dream almost every night that notes have turned up, um, that I, um, I find some extra material. And last night in my dreams I was on the phone to the copy editor saying, do you think everyone would be so upset if I put this scene in? And it was also commonsensical and realistic that when I woke up this morning, I had to pinch myself to know that this scene was not real. I had never written it. Mm. Um, constantly, even in waking life, I think of things that could have been in the book. 
So to me, it seems as if it's, it's not set yet. It is still in process. Did you bring him to his end or did he bring you to his end? He brought me. Yes, that that is quite true. Um, the process of history that decrees on a certain day he died um, gave me a road with no turnings. I must walk down that road. And yet it seemed to me that as soon as he was dead, he sprang up, put his head back on. Just as in the first chapter of the book, he says to his son, I have to watch Aunt Boleyn die. I have to know she really is dead. Otherwise, I have visions of her chasing me along Whitehall with a sword in her hand. So what he he envisages what his nightmare is about Anne is, is something that for me is almost true, that he can't die. And I suppose even when the play is done, the TV series is done, I shall still think of him in the present tense. Perhaps that's why his head is not on the scaffold. He, not even in your book. He is experiencing a river. He is, he has yes. got all these visions of the afterlife, but the head isn't chopped off really. Well, there is nowhere to look, you see. Um, I see, I see. Yeah, of course. There's only his consciousness. So no one can actually see the scene of Cromwell no. dead as he can see and dead. Th there's a um, citation, the last yes. sentence. That's not from Cromwell. No, no, that's Petrarch. Yeah, that's uh, Petrarch. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes. you, you, could, you could have chosen to, to yeah. step out and watch, but you didn't. Uh, yes, uh, it's true. I could have broken the frame at the last, um, but I preferred to end with the mystery of what's behind that door. You see, quite early in the books, he is thinking about Venice and he says to himself, if I ever need to disappear, this is where I shall come. Because what he has seen is apparently a woman walk through a wall. She's on the street, a door opens, she's inside. He doesn't see her go, she's just gone. So this thought comes to his mind. And then when he's dying, he thinks he is again in Venice. And he sees the door, and behind the door a light. But I don't describe him going through the door. So he's somewhere, he's still in process. Yenneke appears. Yes. Yes. And you know what what happened? I thought, Yenneke, that's Hillary coming to have a look. <laughs> you know, that's ingenious. Um, she does give that air of turning up in a spirit of curiosity. And, you know, in real life, there was a daughter, or we think there was an illegitimate daughter. Um, and probably she dated from, she was probably born soon after his wife's death. But from the point of view of a novelist, this is terrible because we have no idea who her mother was. And anything I made up would not only be wrong, but it would be a huge interference with that part of the narrative. Um, so I preferred to cast back to his early life, the unknown part of his life. The simplest thing, of course, would be to forget any idea of an illegitimate daughter. But when it came to it, I thought that's not a creative way. Um, sometimes to do the harder thing is correct, I think. Why? Um, if you always made the easy choices, your fiction would just die 
I think. You, you yourself would die of boredom. You have to be throwing in challenges. <laughs> So I created the character who walks in into the book and out of the book. But I thought it's Hilary herself wanting to have a look. To imagine that that you'd be able to, yeah, to go there and see one scene and talk to one person. What would that scene be, and who would that person be? Uh, no, that's a very good question. Uh, certainly a person I'd want to talk to is Rafe Sadler. Uh, I would trust Rafe. I, I would trust his observation and I would trust his honesty and his knowing Cromwell so well. Not to be uncritical of him, but you know, um, I would trust him as a realistic, hard-headed observer. What would your question be? Um, I, so I think if I wanted to say, you know, what's Cromwell like, I'd go and ask Rafe. Uh, I'm not sure of a particular scene. Um, any such scene I have had the novelist's power to create. Yeah. And I think possibly it is rather, um, it's not very modest to say this, but there's one scene in the book I'm really proud of. And it's quite late in the book and it's just Henry and Cromwell. And they are sitting in the twilight and they are just talking. And the topic ranges over all sorts of things, and they end up talking about their fathers. Mm -hmm. It seems to me very realistic, and it seems to me the product of everything I know about the characters. So if I were to say to you, well, I, I want to be a fly on the wall when Henry and Cromwell are talking, perhaps as men, not about politics. Well, I've had the power to do that. Um, the chilling thing about that scene is that at one point Henry says, I haven't really known you a long time now, Cromwell. Just before the end, it will never come again, this. Yes, it's such an avowal of long friendship and acquaintance should be um, a heartwarming sentiment. But then by the end of the scene, the, the reader knows what the king is saying. I've known you a long time. I thought you could solve all my problems. Now I know you can't, so we're through. And Cromwell has to walk out knowing that. And he has to make a joke about it. He's obviously, he's very shocked, he's chilled. He knows it's some kind of turning point. But why and how, why has it come today? And so just as they've drawn really close, then they're closer than they've ever been and they're about to fly apart. So by giving myself permission to write that scene, which is full of indirection and almost irrelevance, I allowed myself an intimacy with the characters that it really pleased me to have got there with them mm -hmm. so that they could talk about their fathers in such natural terms. And reminisce, or Henry reminisces rather, without my giving a great deal to the reader by way of explanation. So I suppose I am counting on the reader to be right there in that room. Chilling and, and wonderful scene. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was, you know, uh, you, do, you do so much work that never comes to 
Well, it never shows on the page, and mm. so it shouldn't. I had amassed a huge amount of um, material about Westminster Abbey, and the Abbey had been very kind to me in uh, letting me spend time there and taking me around and so on. And uh, I had got such masses of material about the the monks and their way of life and about the last, not the last abbot, but Islip, who's the one I discussed in that scene. And then suddenly this thing jumped out at me about the marrowbone puddings, uh-huh. these penny puddings that Henry the Seventh liked. And that's where Cromwell says, oh, my father liked those too. And it's almost as if they found common ground for the first time. Then he's pulled from beneath them. Well, you know how the scene works. Um, And it was just generated out of that vast mass of material that I processed but it doesn't matter if you only get one phrase no. as long as it's the right phrase uh, awful lot of food in the, in the book yeah. I, li- I love that yes, <laughs> yes I, I, I think that's, that's right and if you look at Cromwell he's obviously a man of ample proportions and so much of the day seemed to be organised around meals and around the efforts of the kitchen. And of course, it's one of those ways in which you give a book uh, a grounding in real life and solidity and texture. Um, It's um, food, music, gardens, um, um, which you must not attract attention to as a piece of knowledge you have, mm. but uh, it, it must be smoothly integrated into the character's view of the world. And you think, what's Cromwell interested in? Well, he's certainly he's interested in cloth in fabric. He, he just knows the price of everyone as soon as he sees them. Um, he's been in Italy. He's worked uh, where luxury fabrics are traded. Um, He's been in the great household of the cardinal with his jewel encrusted robes and so on. Uh, he's been the king's master of the jewel house. So you know um, his eye uh, and his fingers are attracted uh, to the velvets and silks. And then you you think the burden of work this man carries He's going to need a lot of fuel. Perhaps you can say something about what what the 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 novelist can teach you about history that the the historian can't. What the novelist can do is dip a little beneath the surface of events, work around those events which have left a mark on the record which are, as we know, just the tip of the iceberg when you think of what really happened. So history is not what happened, it's just that little bit that remains to us on the record. I think what the novelist asks is, what happened just before the recorded moment? What happened when the eyewitness turns away. In other words, what's next? And while we are all focusing on the incident that is described in historical accounts, what is happening in the next room? Mm -hmm. And, of course, what are people thinking? Which vast field the historian really can't intrude on. Um, We know what happened. We often don't know why. The analysis of motive, it's not a field to which historians are a stranger. But the novelist can look, as it were, at the whole of a person's motivation. 
We don't just make decisions off the top of our head. We make them as a product of our whole life experience and life history. And we make them with the heart and the gut as well as the brain. And by living with a character for a long time, I think a novelist gets a sense of how a person might really work as an integrated organism, whereas to the the historian, they're always like an actor seen on the stage under a bright light. I think maybe the novelist works more in the shadows, in the in the penumbra of great events. I've got a couple of friends who are historians, for instance, Luc Coymans, who is, uh, is very good in the 17th century, he has written about uh, the role of friendship and uh, about Boerhaave, and, and he says, you can't understand those people. They are so different from us. I think you can understand, but you have to start way back and you have to start with the study of religion because if you're looking back to an age of faith where almost every individual believes in God and the afterlife and believes in judgment and heaven and hell, well, think of the spin that puts on everything. Mm -hmm. If you really believe that this world is transitory, that the pains of this world are transitory as well as the pleasures, and that the real thing that matters is the invisible world to come, then obviously you are in a very different mindset from most of the secular-minded people who are walking about in the 21st century. But I was fortunate, I suppose, to have a religious upbringing. I mean, in many ways, unfortunate, because it left me with the usual residue of Catholicism by way of guilt and never feeling good enough. But at the same time, it did induct me into a world where, as a child and young person, I sincerely believed that there was a much bigger invisible reality. And so I don't see it as a great leap to get back into the heads and bodies of those people. You do need to accumulate a great deal of knowledge about context. It's true that political events make very little sense if divorced from their context. And you have to realise that not only the externals of the world are actually very different. It is the way people perceive the world that is very different. It, for example, if you can put yourself into a mindset where the loudest sound you have heard is probably thunder, mm -hmm. or if you've been unlucky, then it might be cannon fire. Mm -hmm and think how that makes you very different from a modern person. Uh, if you do that for all your senses and continually check in with that other self you've, you've created, then again, I think you need to try to understand the bodies as well as the minds of people in another century. But I have to believe it's possible. Um, otherwise, why would their art and poetry and music speak to us as it does? There are common threads that connect us. You lost your faith when you were 12? Yes, quite suddenly. One day it just wasn't there. And living in the 16th century didn't kindle it a bit? It didn't, but it did kindle in me a renewed respect or a rather... I felt myself very, very moved by the early reformers, by the Lollards, as they were in England, similar movements. Um, 
in in Europe, people who were really precursors to Luther and Zwingli and the reformers we all know about. Um, particularly, yes, particularly the people who wish to have the word of God in their own language. Um, Tyndall in in England, but every nation has these stories. Um, that hunger for the word and the innocence of those people in, in many ways move me. Their, their sincerity, their plainness. They have a one-track mind and they will continue with it into the fire. Yes, Tyndall was not a likeable man. I think a lot of people agreed that he was someone whose stubbornness um, made the lives of the people around him rather difficult. And that's all Cromwell's concerned with. He would like Tyndall back in England and the King of England to be on agreeable terms with him. It would make his life so much simpler. But on, on the other hand, you know, there... Tyndall had an admirable patience of persistence and a kind of personal humility that mm. that made him a very commendable character. But, you know, that's what I think. That's certainly not what Cromwell thinks. He just thinks Tyndall is a diplomatic headache. And, of course, nobody likes their failures. And once Tyndall is imprisoned then there is very little that Cromwell as a politician can do to get him out of there. And he is always, you know, he's walking the line in any context with Tyndale because Henry um, has nothing against the notion of the gospel in English, but he has something against Tyndale personally, and that's that Tyndale... Uh, doesn't agree with Henry's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. And um, Cromwell says you think he'd stretch a point to make a friend of the King of England. But, you know, you could argue that Cromwell is a man who does not understand principle. No. Um, he, he really is a pragmatist. Uh, and, of course, this is a struggle towards the end of his own life. Is there, is there any compromise he can make? Would any compromise save him? He'd probably make it if it would. Um, but he don't, doesn't get that opportunity. When I asked you if you could, could go back and meet someone, you didn't want to meet Thomas Cromwell himself. Are you afraid to meet him? Yes, probably, because... I, even though you get this questions about who would you most like to have dinner with, etc., you know that journalists are always coming up with these silly lists you have to make. Um, I've always thought it would be great fun to have dinner with Wolsey. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And you get the gossip. But I have a feeling that if you met Cromwell himself, you might come away none the wiser. Um, in other words, you know, that poem of Thomas Wyatt's that's running through his head as he goes to the scaffold. Uh, there's a line, you know no more than a four you knew. So... I suppose if you felt you understood someone or could understand them, then you wouldn't write three novels about them. What you want is someone who remains a puzzle and a challenge. You want to um, keep that person in the mirror, the mirror that you're holding up. Of course, <laughs> let's face it, a real meeting is very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> oh, wow. one, can't, one can't rule anything out, but it's not likely to take place. So I suppose you could see it in this way, that you're writing three novels over a period of 15 years or whatever. is your attempt to meet someone. 
Um, but you know, you are searching for the inexhaustible subject as a novelist, I think. And I won't say this is the inexhaustible subject, but I would say I haven't exhausted it yet. So I had in mind to write about Cromwell for many, many years, but I also knew it would be the biggest test, that it would be an enormous challenge. And again, it was something that I had to put off until I was ready to face it. It wasn't that I was lacking in the idea or the wish to do it, but I had to... I had to train for it, almost. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote the first words of Wolf Hall, I had the feeling, now I know what I'm doing as if everything else had been practice. And as the books went on, I felt, apart from being assailed by the doubts that beset a writer every day with every line, behind that, I felt, I know where I'm putting my feet. I, I do know how to do this. Uh, there are plenty of days when you think you don't, but mm. I did have a basic confidence that I found my right subject. And um, by the right subject, you mean the one that uses you up almost completely. The, the book that you put everything you know into it. And I think that's the kind of project one seeks all one's life. And for me, Cromwell was just a terrific challenge that I, I had to somehow meet. There are books I've thought of writing and I know that I will run out of time and I simply never shall. And I can let some of them go with a pang of regret, mm. but I can't do it. But if I had shook doing the Thomas Cromwell books, then I would have known. Um, I'd only done half a job. Mm. You know, that I, I wouldn't have fulfilled my own potential. I wouldn't have answered my vocation, if you like. <laughs>